So we're beginning with Saicho, who was the founder of Tendai Buddhism in Japan. And he lived from, set, actually, you can see on your sheet, 767 to 822. And he's known by his posthumous name, Dengyo Daishi. Um, one of the things that many people are not aware of is that his mother was from the Fujiwara clan. And that's important because Buddhism at the time, and Buddhism, for those who don't know, had been introduced in Japan in the 6th century, in the middle of the 6th century. And it had been developing in the city of Nara, um, which is, uh, well, I won't go into that, but it, it developed in the city of Nara and was, that was a seat of the government in Nara, and that was a seat of Buddhism in Japan. Um, during basically for most of the nights, uh, most of the uh, 8th century. And the Fujiwara clan was arguably the most influential clan in Japan. As a matter of fact, so influential that from the time of the Heian period to the present, almost all of the emperor's wives and emperor's mothers were from the Fujiwara clan. And that may sound strange that all the emperor's wives and mothers came from that clan. And so they were very influential back at this time, which was during the eighth century, but they still are to this day, the Fujiwara, the Fujiwara clan. And his father, Saicho's father reportedly was of Chinese heritage. So he was an individual who coming to Japan had a, <clears throat> an interesting past. And you realize that at that time in Japan, there were official monks. These were monks who were essentially supported by the state. And they necessarily uh, were people who were coming from the aristocracy. That was just, that was a given. And the idea of Saicho being there meant that he, number one, had to have an excellent education. Number two, he was uh, an individual who was connected politically and, and socially in Japan. So he had a head start, so to speak, um, when he decided to um, become, become a monk. It's reported that his father, the, the head of the, the center for Tendai Buddhism in Japan is Mount Tie. It is to this day, it's from the time of Saicho. To this day, it's the center of, of Tendai Buddhism, which is to the northeast of Kyoto. And Kyoto is situated specifically so that Hiezan will be on the northeast side, which would protect Kyoto from evil influences. Um, and Saicho's father supposedly had gone up Mount Hie in order to pray for a son. Now, there was no Buddhist temple there, so it was Shinto shrines that were on Mount Hie, but he went up Mount Hie to pray for a son when his when his wife was pregnant, and <clears throat> and with, which which he did, and his son was then was then born, and Saicho himself thus always had a very close connection. And just to sort of put a, a cap on that, you've got to realize that that Shinto, in, in the same way in China, you have a complex of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. You, you don't separate those three. I mean, you can separate them canonically and, and doctrinally, but practically speaking, they are melded together. And in Japan, you add on to that at Shinto. So at the age of 12, which is not <coughs> unusual, Saichi went to study, Saichi went to study um, under Gyoho at a provincial temple. And the provincial temples, the Kokobuji, were temples that were determined by Emperor Shomyu to be, uh, he, he created uh, provisional temples for, <coughs> temples, temples for women um, in all the provinces of Japan. And so um, Saicho lived in Omi, so he went to the provincial temple in the Kokobunji in Omi. And he studied with a monk, uh, Tao Qian, a Chinese monk who brought Northern School of Chan, which well, I, I won't, that's a story in and of itself. I won't go there. But 
northern school of Chan, and he brought Kagon teachings. Kagon, for people who are aware of Chinese Buddhism, is Hua Hien Buddhism. And that's that's a particular type of Buddhism that, that originated in China and was brought to Japan in the <coughs> Um, and, and also the Feng Wan precepts, which we'll talk about in a little while. So Saicho had been under the tutelage of Gyoho, and that, that really is important. Um, and just for, well, no, I'll get to that later. So under, under Gyoho, Saicho studied meditation and Kagon one vehicle or Ekayana doctrine. And that really influenced the rest of his life. And while he was there, he was undoubtedly introduced to Tiantai in, in China, to give you just a, a brief background, by the, by, this, by the time that Saicho had been born in China, the primary influences in China were Chan, which you know as Zen. Chan comes from, is a transliteration of the Sanskrit word dhyana. But when it went to um, Korea, it was transliterated as Son, and when it went to Japan, it was transliterated as Zen. But Chan, Son, and Zen are really, you're talking about the same sorts of things. Although it, there are such cultural influences that it would look different in China or Korea or Japan based upon the culture that was embedded within. So you had the Chan schools and you had Pure Land schools. Pure Land are really important. Pure Land is a transliteration of uh, the, Buddha, the Buddha lands. That would be another way of stating it. And so those, you had Pure Land and the, the, the Chan. Now, one of the things I think we often misunderstand about that is we know Pure Land Buddhism that's in Japan today. It's called Jodo Shu and Jodo Shinshu. And the Pure Land schools uh, eschew meditation, for instance, and they eschew the idea of the, the, the Japanese versions of this. And they do the Jodo Shu uh, still practices, and Jodo is just the, the Jodo world, it's just a translator, it's just the English, it's just the Japanese uh, meaning of Pure Land. Um, still do Nembutsu, which is Namo Mirabu, Namo Mirabu, Namo Mirabu. It's uh, a reference to Amida Buddha, which is one of the five Buddha families. In China, Pure Land was actually an esoteric practice. Many people are not aware of that because they think about it in its Japanese form as Jodo Shu and Jodo Shinshu. But in China, it was an esoteric practice. They would do a walking meditation while reciting the Nambutsu, the Namo Mirabutsu. They would do that, that walking practice and other practices also. As a matter of fact, within Tendai, there's an Amida ritual that was taken directly from um, the Pure Land in China that would look very much like some of the other rituals that we do. So originally in China, it was really considered practice school. So the, the two practice schools were Chan and Pure Land. And then there are two doctrinal schools and the primary doctrinal schools were Tiantai and Hua Hien. And Tiantai is based upon the Lotus Sutra and Hua Hien is based upon the Avantamsaka or Flower Garland Sutra. And they're both sutras that are unlike many of the other sutras that you may have been exposed to like the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Platform Sutra, et cetera. The Diamond Sutra and the Heart Sutra, for instance, are part of the Prajnaparamita group of sutras. Um, the Surigami Sutra is, is yet again different, but the Hua Hien, uh, Kegon in Japanese, Hua Hien in Chinese, and Tiantai becomes Tendai in Japanese, are the two doctrinal schools. And by doctrinal meaning, there's a philosophy that they follow in addition to the practices. Chan tended to eschew much of the doctrinal material and the Pure Land tended to stay with the three primary Pure Land texts. Um, the Hua Hien and the Tiantai tended to be more eclectic and tended to include meditations as well as doctrine materials. And I, I, I could go into that for a long time, but obviously you don't have the time to do that. The, the Kegon One Vehicle, Ekiyana, 
basically both both Tiantai as well as Hua um, Hien develop schemata. And I'll spend just a few minutes to not to describe the schematic because that would take a few weeks. But the idea is that in, in China, during the Song Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty, so we're talking about the 600s, 700s, there were so many different kinds of Buddhism, so many different kinds of Buddhism. They look so different. And both Hua Hien and Tian Tai said, realistically, they look different, but they're the same teaching. And that became really important. When we think of sectarian Buddhism, we think of, for instance, later on in Japan, you have Nichiren who said, no, anything other than doing the uh, Daimokyu uh, is irrelevant. It's not, you shouldn't be doing that. It's, they're called single practice schools. The two primary Zen schools in Japan, uh, Soto Zen and Rinzai Zen, are referred to as single practice schools. They stick to their group of texts and their methods. And Dogen said, all you got to do is sit. That's, that's all you need, is just sitting. Both the Hua Hien and the Tian Tai, and we'll, we'll get on to that in a little, in a little bit, but the Hua Hien and the Tian Tai said no. Buddhism came out of a very rich tradition of what we'll, what we'll now refer to as philosophy. Philosophy, as well as practices, as well as various teachings, all together, they were held together by Shila, by morality and ethics. That was, that was you know, if you look at the Eightfold Noble Path, one part is, is wisdom, one part is morality and ethics, and the other part is meditation and uh, contemplation and concentration. And so the Hua Yen and Tian Tai both adhere to the idea of the Ekiyana, which is that you need, that all, the t all of the Buddhist teachings were the same. And here's what one of the interesting aspects of it is. Each person understands it in a different way. Each person has a different capacity and each person needs their own way of, of not only understanding it, but how they're going to understand it. And they created a schemata of demonstrating in Shakyamana Buddha's early years, he taught this way, as time went on, he changed it for a different group of people, as time went on, he did for another group of people, et cetera. So that over time, he would be teaching the same thing, but he was doing it in a way that everybody would understand it. And that's why it seems like they're so different. That's why it seems like you've got, well, I don't know how many, well, at the time of shortly after Shakyamuni Buddha's death, the Nikaya Buddhism, there were 18 separate schools teaching 18 separate philosophies. By the time you get to the, to the Mahayana, you have dozens more of schools teaching different types of philosophies. And so Tiantai, we'll focus on that now instead of Hua Hien, Tiantai specifically with the Akiyana was saying what was appropriate at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, people had changed. Now we need something that's appropriate a little bit further down the road. A little bit later, we need something else. And that's why you have so many different uh, sutras, and while it looks like it's very different, it's really all about the same Buddhist teaching. Okay, um, I, I spent much more time discussing that than I wanted to. So, but um, let me just say: so during the time that that Saicho, once he had been ordained, he went up to the mountain to. to went up to Mount T.A. I shouldn't say the mountain, that sounds like uh, a different metaphor. But he went to Mount T.A. and he studied these texts. And the Tiantai texts had been in Japan for some time. We even have records of Prince Shotoku in the sixth century who was largely responsible for establishing Buddhism in Japan. Uh, he was a prince, prince regent 
of Japan in the, in the sixth century. We even have records of Prince Shotoku doing commentary on uh, Tianta. Now, from my perspective, that's hagiography, but that's a different issue. Um, anyway, he wanted more texts. And like I said before, Saicho was pretty well plugged in. And the emperor, um, there was some very, I, I could go into the very famous debates in which they're debating, by the way, was a, a practice that enchanted people. It was like an entertainment also, almost watch debates. And he was a hell of a debater. <laughs> you know, it may have been this or that, but he was a very good debater. Prince um, Kamu really appreciated Saicho and asked him to go to China and get more Tiantai texts, but also to pick up how to do esoteric practices. In Japanese, it's called Mikyo, which are mudras, mantras, and visualizations. Why did they want him to do that? Because that's how you protected the nation. You think about it as sort of magic uh, in, in one sense. As a matter of fact, that the term, how would you how would you translate Mikio? Not from an academic perspective, but like I have to say esoteric. Right? esoteric yeah, esoteric, esoteric but right. but in but if you were to say in Japanese, it also has like a magical meaning to it. Right. It's almost like you're thinking about it's it's all, almost like about caring for the ecosystem. Yes. Metaphysical ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. But so it it is. Um, has a magical component to it. And so it was felt that using the esoteric practices, Japan at the time was like many, like Europe was in the seventh century, the eighth century. They had plagues, they had floods, they had disasters. And so doing these things they hoped would, would uh, uh, help mitigate the effects of these disasters, whatever they might be. And so that's that's ultimately why the emperor wanted them to do it. Now, there came about a difference. There was that aspect. But from a spiritual perspective, the, the esoteric practices are intended to assist one in attaining awakening. So on a daily sort of a provisional basis, they were seen as a way to help the nation through its difficult periods of floods and famines and earthquakes, et cetera. From a spiritual perspective, it's a way to assist one in attaining awakening. That was the ultimate reason for it. As it was developed in India, starting around um, the first century uh, CE, that's when the esoteric practices began, specifically at Nalanda. And it probably came originally out of Central Europe, but Nalanda became the center for some of those practices. In, uh, that would have been Northeast India. Um, I'm spending much more time explaining some of this than I should. Um, so let me let me go down here. Are there any questions before I go on? Um, let me ask that. Would you wish that I weren't so complete? <laughs> <laughs> I get I get no response. Is anybody awake? Yeah. <laughs> So he was sent to China. I won't go into the whole thing in China, but in China, he specifically was sent by the emperor in order to attain or obtain Tiantai materials, which they wanted in Japan. And they wanted, um, and also to pick up the esoteric initiation and the esoteric teachings, which they wanted to bring back. Now, the emperor was in no way interested in meditation. Most people think about Buddhism as meditation. No, the majority of Buddhists in the world do not meditate. That may be shocking to some people. The majority of the Buddhists in the world do not meditate. Meditation was reserved for those who had the time and the patience to do it. If you were the average person, when were you going to meditate? You, you had to go from sun up to sun down every day to survive just farming or your craft, whatever it was. Meditation is something. However, Buddhism as a form of 
ethics and morality, Buddhism in terms of some of the philosophy, depending upon which form of Buddhism you're talking to, was something that people could do. Now, the meditation was very important to Saicho. And it's not, it's not incidental that both the Rinzai Zen school and the Soto school came out of Tendai. The meditation that we do is called Shikan. Dogen took one form of the meditation. Isai, the founder of Rinzai, took another form of the meditation. They said, we're just going to do this. We're not going to do all this other stuff. We're just going to do the meditation form. The Pure Land schools, which also came out of Tendai, said, we're not, we don't need that meditation stuff. We're just going to take the philosophy that's, re, that's related to Pure Land. Nichiren said, I'm just going to take the Lotus Sutra. So you had all these other schools that eventually came out of Tendai, but Tendai at the time, and still, they're all internal to, to Tendai. And going just going down a little bit, so while in China, he received the Oxhead School on Tiantai Mountain. And Paul Broner writes that this made little impression on Sideshow, but I'm not I'm, I'm personally not so sure that the Oxhead School didn't have more of an impression on Saicho. And I, I won't go into that now because we really don't have the time. Sometime I'd like to discuss why I disagree with, with Paul about that. Um, and the, the Oxhead School died out in China shortly after, uh, by the time Saicho was, shortly after Saicho had died, the Oxhead School had died out because it was a synthesis of the Northern Cha'an and the Southern Cha'an. And um, the Southern Chan won the battle, so to speak. And um, but he also brought back with him Shikan, which is Shamata and Vipassana. And so you'll hear a meditation that's referred to as Shamata, and you'll hear meditations referred to as Vipassana. Shamata means calming the mind, and Shapat and Vipassana means discerning the real. So sometimes they refer to um, shamata as concent concentration and vipassana as contemplation. Those are the two primary forms that it takes. You look at Dogen Zen, Soto Zen, that's primarily shamata. You look at Rinzai Zen, that's primarily vipassana. So you see those two forms in, in that fashion. And interestingly enough, the term vipassana that you hear like from insight society didn't occur until the, the 18th century, 18th to 19th century in Burma. And it was a response to colonialism because, Buddha, because meditation had died out in South Asia totally. And then it, was, it, was, it became a form of nationalism. Buddhism became a form of nationalism as a response to colonial influences in the uh, 18th to 19th century. That's when it that's when it, when it began to rise again. Um, he also brought in, and I won't go into it, in, but the, he did the Abhisheka, which is Kanjo in Japanese, which are the initiations in the Taizukai and Kongokai Mandala. It's an esoteric practice that I won't go into. Um, now, what's important to remember as part of this is that in Nara, I started talking about Nara before there were six schools and without going into the details of the six, six schools, they were really pretty, and, and, and you had these, these, these ordained folks who were um, basically paid by the state to be monks. They were, they were state monks, essentially. All of the six schools had a certain number. And Saicho, when he came back, he did... Well, I'm, I'm just going to go down and you'll see where it says Saicho's important contributions to Butsudo. I'm just going to pick up from there. Um, just, be, just above there, though, it talks about the six schools of Buddhism and Nara. And Saicho felt that they were ex excessively narrow. And by excessively narrow, what I'm saying is that they, they only practiced what it was they practiced. One was Kegon, which I said before was Huayen. Another was um, Sanron which were the, the, five, the three scrolls, Sonron meant the three scrolls, three books, and that adhered to a particular philosophy and, and they didn't go outside their lane. 
And for the most part, they didn't meditate. You did have some people who were going up to meditate on retreats periodically, but for the most part, that wasn't that wasn't the Buddhist scene at the time. And Saicho was just very unhappy with that. So he went to Hiezon and established his temple on Hiezon, um, which he, he had done before. Actually, he had gone uh, abroad. He spent 10 years on Hiezon before he went to China. But when he came back, he didn't want to have anything to do with Nara. And so he established an ordination platform. Now, up till this time, one of the schools in Nara was the Ritsu school which followed the Vinaya. And the Vinaya are the 300, the 200 and approximately 250 rules for men and the 320 rules for women. That was part of early Nikaya Buddhism. One of the things that he picked up, that Saicho picked up when he was in China was the Fang Wang, which are the Bodhisattva vows, the 10 major vows, the 48 minor vows. The Vinaya were extremely prohibitive. Bodhisattva vows, on the other hand, you can imagine the difference between 250 versus 10 and 48, were intended not for just people who were ordained, but for everyone. Anybody could do them. You didn't even have to be ordained to take those vows. And that's an important aspect. Because that meant that all the schools after that, because he had instituted that practice, and I won't go into the politics of it, but he had instituted that practice, which meant that all the Buddhist schools after that, none of them followed the Vinaya. They all followed the Bodhisattva vows. That in and of itself was seminal to Japanese Buddhist development. Okay. Um, so propagation of Tiantai, the doctrinal use of the Lotus Sutra and Tiantai teachings, he introduced both the Oxhead School as well as Shikan, Shamata, and Vipassana in a way that made them accessible to people using the Tiantai, uh, Makashikan, and Shoshikan. And he introduced the Taimitsu, and I won't go into the difference between, there's two different kinds of esoteric practices in Japan, I won't go into the details of that, but he introduced that and established the Bodhisattva vows that I just talked about. Additionally, he adopted Ichigo Sanzen, 3,000 realms are contained in one mind, which is a very important teaching in Japanese Buddhism. And here is something that's very important. Angaku Shiso, or doctrine of original enlightenment, which means within every single person here, there is an awakening. It's not something that you attain, it's something that you Un unveil, so to speak. You remove, re you remove the obscurations that hinder you from recognizing the awakening that resides within you. There were some schools of Buddhism in Japan and in China that said, no, you've got to spend three eons of practice, and then you might be able to get awakened. There are some schools that said awakening isn't the right thing for every Some people are never gonna be awakened. Doesn't matter what you do, it ain't gonna happen. There were some schools that said, I mean, there are different philosophies of Buddhism that apply this. He's the person who brought into Japan the idea of Hongaku Shiso, original enlightenment, which means not only is awakening accessible to everyone, but, and this is what changed much of Japanese Buddhism. You can do it in this lifetime. It's not something up until that time. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. There are other philosophers that were talking about this in China. But in Japan, this was a, a really a quite different notion. That within this lifetime, you can attain awakening. You didn't have to wait for three eons of practice. You're talking about rebirths. You know being reborn and reborn and reborn multiple times. Um, no, you can do it with it. Is it gonna happen very often? Probably not, but you could, you know, let's not, let's not fool anybody here. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get really high and say, I'm gonna do it tonight, you know, but 
theoretically you could. <laughs> um, and he set, the, he set the stage for the Pure Land practices, which didn't actually begin in Tendai until Jishin, who was the person who accompanied him to China. But he set the stage for it. He created the idea of Ekiyana in such a way that incorporated Pure Land. And Pure Land practices are really integral to Tendai uh, philosophy in, in Japan, and then provided the basis for Ekiyana teachings. What that means in a, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Next Thursday, I'll be giving a talk for um, the Buddhist Church of America, which is Jodo Shinshu in America, for their ministers. They're having a, sempo, a seminar, a symposium, not seminar, symposium. So they asked if I would do a, a section on uh, Pure Land because as a Tendai monk, <laughs> we're the ones who brought it to Japan, you know, and so they want to hear what what is how does Tendai look at this? You know, we've got our own take on it. Well, what's our take? Well, you know what, their take is our take. That's really what it comes down to. That if if Ekiyana would, did not exist, I wouldn't be able to do that because there would be a, such a thing as no, my way is the right way. In your way, oh, you're a Nichiren practitioner? Forget about it. Ain't no way you're going to be awakened. You know, doing that, doing that Daimoku stuff. You know, come on, give me a break. What about what about in here? Since I've had my back to you, does anybody have? And I realize you've heard about Saicho many times. Yes. What in um, Saicho's important contributions? You know, when you're talking about this meditation contributions. I know that Shimata and Vipasha, but what is New Tong Zhong? New Tong Zhong, that's the Octet School. That's just the Chinese name. That's the word for for Shikan? No, 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 those are different ideas. The Octet School was a school of Buddha, of Chan yeah, I know. in China. It was totally separate from Shikan. Okay, so that's just the name of the school. It isn't a that's the name of, that's the name of the Chan school and the med, and the type of meditation that goes along with that particular school. Yeah. Okay, so it is a type of meditation. It's the Oxhead school. It's Oxhead school. Yeah. Okay. And, and essentially, part of the Oxhead school would eventually give rise to what we think of as Rinzai, is that doing koan practice. Yeah. 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 On Mount Hie, do, the, uh, do all the monks meditate, or yes. some people choose to? On Hie, on well, on the, on the, I, I, yeah, no, I understand what you're asking. To be clear, when you're training, everybody's meditating. Yeah. After that, some monks meditate, some monks meditate, some do not. Some only do esoteric practices. Some only do meditation. Some only do a chanting practice. Really depends upon what temple that they're associated with and the type of practice that, that they would normally do. So on on itself, like say during training, everybody yeah. learns to do it. But after that, you know, either because of the temple that you're associated with or because your own predilections, you're going to do whatever it is that you do. So for instance, if, if when we think of um Kene Itosa, his temple, his family's temple, is a temple. Their practice was primarily uh, esoteric practice, so that's what he would. That's what he would do. It's not. Maybe he could change that. Who knows? He's got his own temple now. So what he does, although I don't think so, I think he'll still continue continue to do the esoteric. But theoretically, he could say, enough of that. I've had it. I'm going to pure land practice by comparison. People that do Kaihokyo. Right. Do Kaihokyo. Well, he, he did Kaihokyo. Yeah. He did 100 day Kaihokyo. So he did that. So, and as part of that, he has to do an esoteric practice. And as part of that, he has to go back to um, what's the name of the falls? Asuka falls uh, once a year. And it's a one day, or I'm mean, sorry, a seven day, one week practice at, with the other people who've done the 100 day. And he has to do that for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> then, 
And they just have to do it anymore. <laughs> Any guarantees about awakening? There's no guarantees. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think it, it, I think it speaks to the, 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 they'll do certain it, many monks like stay on stay on the mountain like you're talking about yeah for periods of time they do uh, they can eventually off as well and do whatever they they change, right. change they change practices over their lifetime as well that's right I mean, based on yeah let me ask on on the the this virtual here uh, do people have practice do, does anyone have a question. Was I was I understandable enough to, so that you would have a question? It, I realize it's a lot of stuff to cover, and I'm covering it in an hour is really not enough. Uh, first, first is Keith, and then Brian. Oh, Keith, I thought your hand was up. Never mind. No, no, sorry. Okay, Brian, go ahead, please. Um, I, I I know at the end, I know at the beginning you you expressed about you know, um, the feelings about evangelization and not being Buddhist. And and at the same time, like I wonder, like even in, in what, what you said, where it said, uh, Saisho presented Tendai as a corrective to the types of Buddhism. It, it, even if it doesn't become evangelization as, we, as might be experienced in the West from let's say different Christians and different mm -hmm. Christian, um, uh, versions of Christianity, isn't there a certain um, <sighs> praising of the, hey, this is good, you should know about it, and I can tell you more about it, that that has been done historically, and I would even argue necessary in the times in which we live, um, just to be heard above the noise. Well, I, and, and that, that's, that's a good point. I think the distinction is we call it propagating the Dharma. In other words, making it available, but not claiming that this is going to solve all your problems. Although I have to say that there are Buddhist schools that do make that claim. Mm -hmm. So you know, in the Japanese Buddhist schools who will make that claim. But it's, there's a difference between propagating the Dharma, which is making it available, versus sort of promising that if you do this all your problems are going to be taken care of mm -hmm. that I, I would say that's the distinction okay Thank yes you. Uh, had a question uh, yes Zena. um from my own meeting uh about hongako shiso i saw people that have claimed that it could be used as an argument to be discriminatory and there were a lot of Buddhists who were critical of it, though I now realize this might be kind of off topic, but I wondered if there's something you could say or know about this topic. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that when we, when we talk about Hanga Kushi, so there, there, and there's, there's another aspect to what you were saying, I think, and that is that especially when we match that with sort of the, the notion of emptiness, in which we seem to unground ourselves, um, to put it bluntly, um, that can lead to a kind of, of exaggeration of saying, well, I'm already enlightened, so what? I don't have, there's nothing I've got to do. The idea, that, that would be an actually antithetical to the idea of Hongo, Hongaku Shiso, because Hongaku Shiso is, if you got it, you don't even have to talk about it. <laughs> you know, that's really so. If you find somebody saying, you know, I've been awakened, run, do not walk to the door to leave. <laughs> because that's that's an exaggeration. And I I can understand why why you were asking the question. I think that it can be a problem, and I've seen it as a problem in some in some cases. But you know, to go into it further would take a lot more time than I have right now, but that, that's a really great question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions before we move along? Yes. Um, it, it seems like a shooing Nara, Nara and going up to um, Mount Hie was rather radical. Is that, is that an incorrect assumption? There were monks who did leave Nara and go to other places, but you're right, it was pretty radical. 
Was it less so because he had an emperor's favor? Um, was he asked to do it? He didn't really have the emperor's favor so much until he came off the mountain. And the emperor was impressed by the discipline that he had and his learning because he used the time for study. And that's why he was such a great debater. Yeah. But it certainly didn't help that his mother was a Fujiwara. <laughs> he was it would have yeah, something going for it. Yeah. 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 Any other questions before we okay? I'm gonna ask the folks. Oh, oh Jody, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh thank you for making that distinction between um proselytizing and propagating the Dharma as a distinct way of transmitting. Um, especially since in the in the Pali Sutta, the 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 bhikshu are commissioned to go in pairs and to go out and teach. Mm -hmm. And I can see the distinction you're making now between propagation and proselytization. Proselytizing, right. yeah. 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 That's, that's a subtle but I think important distinction. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I'm going to ask now that the people who are in person go out to the hondo, and I'm going to finish with a Dharma talk. And I'm just going to give a very brief uh, Dharma talk. Um, we're sitting here again with masks on, and I wanted to think. We all thought we were past that and we're moving on to the next phase, post pandemic, so to speak. And boy, were we wrong. This new phase of the pandemic is referred to as a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And this, of course, has been exacerbated by the Delta variant, which is more transmissible than the Alpha variant, the one we started with, uh, that first spread in North America. And I've been reading that there's now a significant feeling of animosity toward those who are unvaccinated by the vaccinated. I've been reading about it more and more. And to make matter worse, those who've been fully vaccinated have been vulnerable to the Delta variant. Almost half of the people who came down with COVID-19 in Albany County recently, half have been fully vaccinated. Now, the good news is that for those who have been vaccinated, they don't, they don't have a severe form of the virus and it's pretty mild. Um, and it's so the vaccine is protecting people from a, a virulent form. On the other hand, we know that with the Delta, people who are vaccinated can transmit it to others. They can be a vector for other people, hence the masks. And we also know the Delta variant affects children much more than the Alpha variant. In a hospital in Florida, it went from 20 children with COVID in June up to 240 children in July, from 20 in June to 240 in July. And as of yesterday, there were 160 children in just one hospital. However, that makes the people who are fully vaccinated even more aggrieved at those who are unvaccinated because they're the ones who are spreading the virus. I now wear a mask when I go to the grocery store to do other errands. It, it, I'm back to where I was you know, six months ago wearing the mask. And I'm pretty sure that probably most of you are doing the same thing. I'm also tempted to blame the unvaccinated, though I mitigate that with the recognition that many, if not most of those who are unvaccinated are following the disinformation and disinformation and misinformation of the political leaders and the social media. And people are exploiting the disaster for their own ends. The unvaccinated are sort of like sheep following their leaders to the slaughter. That's literally what's happening in places like Louisiana and um, Florida and Texas. This aspect makes me saddest. It's not necessarily the political and social media 
social media ramifications of the virus and our response. No, what makes me most sad is that people are thinking of political posture or following the advice of conspiracists, not thinking of other people. The frame of reference is in regards to the vaccine is often get the vaccine so that you don't get COVID. You know, from a public health perspective, we don't think that way. We think of, we're gonna give the vaccine so that other people don't get COVID. Now, it's important that you don't get COVID, don't get me wrong. On the other hand, from a public health perspective, it's so that other people, you don't spread it, essentially. Interpenetration is the Buddhist term for this. We are not autonomous sentient beings going about our lives for our own benefit alone. We exist in a larger web of existence, far beyond the rock traveling around a star. What you do, positive and negative, has an effect on those around you, no matter how large or how small. And this is true of this pandemic. It is true of our environment and the climate catastrophe that we're currently experiencing. And I wanna quote Rabbi Hillel here because he said it best. Rabbi Hillel was a medieval uh, Jewish philosopher. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am not for others, what am I? If not now, when? This becomes really important. We've got to stop thinking about the vaccine, vaccine just in terms of, I'm going to get it so I don't get sick. We have to think about it and express it to others. Here, I'm propagating <laughs> pro-vaccination, if you will, that we need to let people know that it's not just their benefit. It, you know, people say, it's my body, it's my choice. Wrong. Yes, it's your body. But you're choosing, and I don't think anybody that I'm speaking to that I'm looking at here is, are one of those, but people are choosing not by not getting vaccinated, they're choosing to affect other people negatively. That's the choice they're making. It's not just a choice about themselves. It's a choice about others. And we have to begin to do two things with this pandemic. We have to think about the virus as not an enemy. We've evolved with viruses. It's killing people. It killed over 600,000 people in America. I don't, it's one and a half million people worldwide, whatever the number is at this point, I don't know. But yes, it's killing people. But we evolved with viruses. The virus is part of our ecosystem. As our ecosystem is being degraded, we're being exposed to things like the viruses more and more. So the virus and the climate catastrophe are part of the same issue. And we've got to stop thinking about how does it affect me, both the virus and the vaccination, and how it affects others. We've got to reframe the reference point. That's all I've got to say this evening. Thank you for joining us.